Hello, organisational behaviour people. This is Buzzy1029. In this lecture recording, we're going to talk about the elements of organisational structure and how to use those elements to design effective organisations. So the key aims for this recording are that by the end of it, you should be able to describe some of the basic elements of organisational structure. You should be able to think about how you could use those elements to design an organisational structure according to different schools of thought. And we're going to look at the classic management, strategic management environment, and we'll call it, here I've put socio-technical, but I'll call it techni technological, schools, technological, schools. And hopefully like, you know a bit about what socio-technical systems ideas are already, but we'll talk about it in terms of technology, it's probably easier. Anyway, and then throughout the lecture, we're going to think a little bit about contextualising some of the trends in organisational design. The core reading for this lecture recording is unfortunately quite long. In the sixth edition, there's four chapters which we're going to pick on, and in the ninth edition, there is three chapters, chapter 15, 16 and 17. Now, you'll notice a couple of things I just want to clarify at this stage. From the 6th to the ninth edition, Huxinski and Buchanan start talking about organisational architecture rather than organisational structure. That's not a term that I've seen widely used in the literature and isn't one that I personally like because I think it's very easy to confuse with the built environment of organisations, which is a separate topic in and of itself, one we're not covering on this course. So, I'm going to stick with the idea of structure rather than architecture, but when you look in the ninth edition, where you see discussions of architecture, I think you'll actually find nine times out of ten they actually use the term structure as well. But if architecture makes more sense and works for you, you know, please feel free to use it. You'll also notice in the reading that uh, Huxinski and Buchanan devote a lot of time to talking about bureaucracy. In this recording, we're not going to talk about bureaucracy because on my understanding, bureaucracy isn't a element of structure. It's not about the form of the organisation. Bureaucracy is a way of doing things. It's a way of organising work processes within, within organisations. It's a style of organisational culture, a way of relating in organisations. So we're going to talk about all bureaucracy when we talk about culture. So some of the reading for all in these chapters will actually help support our video on organizational cultures. So let's get on with it. We've got some you know, disclaimers there, but let's deep dive now into organizational structures. This is one of my favorite topics. One of my favorite ways for understanding organizations is to think about them structurally. So when we think about organizations structurally, what we're trying to do is to understand the form of the organization. So there's a number of elements which people tend to focus on. They see these are the ones Buchansky, Huxinski and Buchanan highlight. They talk about work specialization, hierarchy, spans of control, chains of command, departmentalization, formalization, centralization. Now, again, I'm not massively a fan with some of their terms here because I think some of their terms like work specialization and formalization are not structural elements. Those are actually about the process of how to do work. So I'm going to reduce it down to these elements. Again, if you prefer the Huxinski and Buchanan ones, that's great. But I think it's actually, for me, it's easier to make sense of structural issues thinking about just structure. So not process, just structure. So when we try to describe an organisation in terms of its structure, I'm going to suggest we're looking at four things. First, and they're interrelated. Firstly, we're going to think about how is the command and control function structured. So is power or control in the organization centralized to a core group of decision makers or is it decentralized so that everybody in the organization has a degree of autonomy? Is there a single um, a single locus or single place that has power or multiple places that have the ability to tell people what to do? So this is the first element and we can call this, sometimes it's called the locus of control locus meaning the place of control or the unity of command how united the command function and that's a term developed by Charles Perrault. Next we're going to think about the departmentalization of organizations. 
That is, how are they divided within themselves? When we've talked about organisations, um, different types of organisations, when we've talked about organisations in their relationship to the environment, we've considered organisations as being pluralistic or what Herbert Simon calls a group of groups of having subunits within them. And the departmentalization element of structure is our way of describing the ways that an organization is broken up into different departments or specialisms. Next, we're going to think about the spans of control. So the span of control is different from the locus of control. The locus of control tells us who has power in the organization. The span of control is the number of people or units that they have control over. So you could have a wide span of control, which means you would have control over lots of people, or you can have a narrow span of control. And finally, we're going to think about the formal chains of command, communication and reporting. So these are the, the ways that organizations move orders, decisions and information up and down the organization. So let's go through each of these in turn and dive a little bit deeper into each of them. So when we talk about the locus of control, it's really what we're talking about here is power. What we've talked, talked about so far on the course as power. And the question is ultimately, should power be centralized or decentralized? Should there be a hierarchy of different levels distinguished by the power, their level of power, or should we have a, what's called a flat organization or a decentralized organization where everybody has the same amount of power? Herbert Simon, in his text Administrative Behavior, says you can think about hierarchy as the specialization of decision making, long range planning or thinking about the future and authority. So when an organization has a hierarchy, what it essentially does is it creates certain subunits, certain departments that don't make stuff or do stuff. Their job is to make decisions, to tell other people what to do and how to do it. So when we think in these terms, we tend to differentiate what's sometimes called top management or C-level or board level or executive level management from middle management, from supervisors and workers. Henry Mintzberg sort of comes up with his own terms for pretty much the same thing, but he talks about an organization being differentiated when it comes to its power or control, and that you can have the strategic apex, which are the people, you know, the, the top level of the organization that set the organization strategy. The techno superstructure, which are the, the middle managers who make decisions about how to enact that strategy. The operating core, which are the, the group of workers who make the organizations function. Support staff, who then help people on the ground. And then what's called middle and line workers who are actually doing the work. So you can see wh whichever ter sets of terms you prefer, what each of these ways of speaking is doing is cutting up the organization into different levels depending on who has control. Now, when we talk about the unity of command, we're not only thinking about are there different levels with, with differing levels of power, but within each of those levels, how many groups have the same level of authority or the same level of power? And the issue here is when control can be, can be centralized, but is not unified, it's possible for those at the top of the organization to give conflicting advice or conflicting orders. And when this, so well not when control, when is not unified is what I should say, not unified. So when this happens, the, the subordinates faced with a the problem, they could have two different directions, which might be completely opposite. You know, they might be told to service the customer and to sell as much money as possible. They might be told to support students, but also to invest in their research. They might be told to do, you know, to protect civilians, but also to kill bad guys. There's a range of different conflicting orders that you can imagine in organizations. And what, what happens here then is that the subordinate has to make their own decision. 
often they can't please everybody so they have to make their own decision which means although control might be centralized there might be a strong locus of control if there's not a unity of command actually the control gets pushed down the organization Jacques in 1982 had a nice way of thinking about um, the levels of control that people have in his concept the time span of responsibility so this is essentially thinking how long does somebody's decisions commit the organization to a particular course of action for and this he argued is a way of thinking about the amount of control different people have so you know, if you're at the till the cash register in a restaurant your decisions have a very little time span if you decide to give somebody you know one pound rather than 250 p's it doesn't really matter it's not committing the rest of the organization to do something so you have a low time span of control if you are the chief executive of mcdonald's and you decide that you're going to open restaurants in a new market well that's going to involve building the restaurants building up supply chains running marketing campaigns recruiting and capital and investing that capital this is going to be a long time span of responsibility so this is just another way again of dividing up the organization to thinking about where does control lie now in recent years there have been a move many moves to flatten organizations so here we can have we've got two little organizational charts which give you a good illustration of this a flat organization has very few levels to it so you have very few supervisors to subordinates what does this mean well it means there's very clear lines of control but it also means the people at the bottom have much more autonomy because there's fewer people to tell them what to do what could be told a tall organization chart or a hierarchical organizational chart has a variety of levels where you'd have you know here at the top you'd have your C level or top management you'd have your middle management and then you get down to the people at the bottom doing the work who have very little autonomy because they've been told what to do by their supervisors they've been told what to do by their support staff they've been told what to do by their middle managers who have been told what to do by their top managers so in the popular management and organization studies press it's often argued that tall organizations are inefficient unresponsive and really not appropriate for VUCA volatile uncertain you know and ambiguous environments and that flat organizations where people closest to the work have more autonomy and decision-making power should be preferred this is an open question though okay so I've talked about locus of control unity of command next we've got differentiate departmentalization or specialization so this is based on a simple observation that when organizations grow they tend to start doing more and more complicated activities there tends to be more and more interrelationships between people and parts of the organization and to make sense of that it typically becomes more efficient to differentiate bits of the organization so that might be dividing the organization up in terms of the products that it makes or particular functions we'll talk through some of these examples in a moment so typically what we think here is when there's a, a diversity and variety of things to be done it's necessary to differentiate them but of course as the organization gets split up into different subunits you then differentiated you then have the problem of integration how are those subunits going to work together and of course here you can hopefully see where we get into problems of the unity of command so there's different ways to differentiate organizations or to departmentalize them here are some of the most common you could divide an organization up in terms of its functions so you might have you know marketing sales production in research and development as separate functions you might have the organization divided up in terms of geographies you know, so all the people in North America work together all the people in Europe work together and then you would have separate functions so you might have marketing for North America marketing for Europe marketing for Asia Pacific you could do the same in terms of products or particular markets so no longer the geographical location of the workers but the types of markets so you know this might be commercial 
government education markets and so on. <clears throat> most recently, we've seen most organizations find these kinds of simple vertical differentiations. And it's called vertical because you can see these lines are organized vertically up and down. Create problems for organizations because, you know, if you've got it organized geographically, you've got marketing being conducted in three locations. But actually, some functions probably you could do all from one function like accounts. You probably don't need to have different accounts in different locations, particularly with Internet technologies. So this makes these kinds of simple vertical differentiations quite clunky and at times inefficient. So instead, what we started to see is what's called a matrix function, where you know you don't just have vertical differentiation, but you can also have horizontal differentiation. Now, here we go back to the problem of the unity of command. One of the benefits of vertical differentiation is it's very clear. If you're in North America, you report to the North America division. Or if it's a functional separation, if you're in marketing, you report to the marketing director or the head of marketing. If you're in sales, you report to the head of sales. When you have a matrix function, all of a sudden it can become very difficult. You might not know whether you're supposed to report to you know, the head of marketing or the head of the electronics division, whether you're supposed to report to the director of sales or the director of the Europe division. And when this happens, you get the problem of the unity of command right, or the disunity of command. So this is the first question for differentiation. How is it that you should vertically differentiate, departmentalize the organization? And then we get the question of horizontal integration. So if you've divided your organization up into different vertical lines, how are they supposed to relate to each other? In 1967, Thompson talked about this in terms of pooled integration, where you know you have one unit d working together, so pooling their activities, but working independently from others. You can have sequential interdependence, where one department does something, then hands the work over to somebody else, or reciprocal, where people are giving and taking products and services from other departments continually. So this is horizontal integration. So we've got vertical differentiation creates the need for horizontal integration. So here's a little bit more about how you can horizontally integrate. And what we've started to realize is that many organizations have line relationships, which is reporting lines. We'll talk about that later on. Staff relationships, which are essentially supporting lines. So the people who have a staff relationship offer support functions to others. And then functional relationships. Functional relationships are people that are working together on something. You can't really see the, the lines too well on this, but if you look in the key reading, that hopefully will make sense. So vertical integration, it's it's not only the the way, the, the type of integration, the type of relationship, but, but there's also different styles. So you could pool sequen sequential reciprocal, which is going to talk about in a bit based on technology but also line staff and functional relationships so again line is reporting lines command lines staff is support function lines and then functional relationships are people who are working together to do something okay so that's departmentalization next we've got span of control this is probably the easiest of the the structural elements to understand which is simply how many subordinates does a superordinate or a supervisor have within a given department or unit? Charles Perrault reports that many classic management theorists and practitioners believe that when you've got above five people in a group, that group would become uncontrollable. It would be impossible to effectively control them because there'd just be too many people. And what this means is you have to have more and more and more supervisors, which means you have to have more and more and more managers, which means you start to get into tall organizational structures if you want to have control. But again, remember the key point here, right? You might not want the group to be controllable. You might want to give the group lots of autonomy, lots of freedom, as we've seen in our classes on groups and teams. Autonomous teams often tend to be high performance teams, but they can be very dangerous 
for managers to cede all of that control to them. So really this is, although Pro says, you know, you shouldn't have more than five, that's only if you want to control the work group. But yeah, like here's a visual, and again, it's a little bit blurry, but you can see if you have a small span of control, you can start to see how very quickly you need more and more layers of management. You need more and more layers of control. You need a bigger hierarchy to have the same number of operatives or line staff people doing the work. This is a good little example, which you can read through in your own time, which is the army, the British army, and the span of control there. So, you know, five men form a squad. Then you get five sergeant squads equal a platoon. So you can see how it's all based on pretty small numbers, but the span of control can quickly, as long as you've got a nice big hierarchy, can quickly start to accommodate lots of people. So that's the span of control. And then we've got chains of command, reporting, and communication. So we've talked a little bit about line staff and functional relationships already. So chains of command is who can tell who what to do, very similar to locus of control. Chains of communication is who can talk to who, who can give people information. Often this is matched by things like committee structures, reporting structures. But then there are formal lines of reporting. So these are within line relationships. Who is it that staff or subordinates can report to? And we see this kind of issue come up a lot when it's when there's discussions of whistleblowers. You know, when there's a, a whistleblower, that typically means they're unable to report up some unethical practice that's taking place in the organization, so they have to report out. This shows that there is a dysfunctional organization. Perot also gives a neat example where he observes that what can happen in many organizations is leaders at the top of a hierarchy have a tendency to try to micromanage, which means they try to tell middle managers more of what more what to do, which means the middle managers start to micromanage their subordinates. And what happens in every case is that the leaders and the managers functionally demote each other. They don't trust those beneath them. They start telling them what to do. But in so doing, they're acting outside of the locus of control and undermining the sphere of competence. And this, uh, if anybody picks up, is what is being shown in this image here, right? That the you know, one person shouts at another, who goes and shouts at the person beneath him, who goes and shouts at his parrot, and then the parrot shouts at the person at the top. Okay. <coughs> so, once you understand the issue of the locus of control, the unity of command, the span of control, the departmentalization, and the reporting lines and command lines. You can start to chart different organizations. So you see here, you can describe or literally visualize different forms of organizations, irrelevant of how or what the organization is doing. So these come from Gareth Morgan's um, types of organizational structures. You can have very rigidly structured vertical departmentalization. You can have departmentalization with more horizontal integration. You can start to have like crazy funky matrix structures. You can have project teams where instead of organizing around a function or a particular product, you organize around a particular project. And you can have what's sometimes called networked or loosely cu coupled or organic structures where really you don't have very set spans of control, you don't have very set departmentalization and you just leave it to the organization, the team members to figure it out for themselves. Okay, so let's see where are we up to. Oh, let's keep going. So yeah, I've just cut out here. There are some structural elements of processes which are often confused with organizational structure, but I think it's useful to think about them differently. So decision making processes, the role of technology, membership and entry criteria, job roles, formalization or bureaucratization, the style of supervision. These aren't about the form of the organization. These are about how the organization does things. 
but you'll see they are often discussed and often decisions around processes can be affected by the structure of the organization or vice versa if an organization chooses to have close supervision well it tends to need very strong bureaucratization clear job roles clear lines of and so you start to if you choose a particular type of process it has implications for the structure now the important point here and this again is a point made by charles perot is that very often when you're analyzing sorry organizations those organizations can appear to have failures or problems based on process but actually the processes are a consequence of the structure or vice versa it's easy to think there's a problem with the organization structure when actually it's just that there is a poorly fitting process at work but we're not talking so much about processes on this module you'll talk about some of those hopefully elsewhere in your courses there's also structural relationships that organizations have with other organizations you know they could outsource they could enter into joint ventures they could enter into partnership or they could purchase other organizations so there's structural relationships outside of organizations as well again we're not going to talk too much about them in this video one neat trend in organizations although whether it's current or not i'm not so sure john child talks about it in 2015 but it's a form of organizing which has been you know, widely criticized since at least the year 2000 by naomi klein is sometimes described as hollow organizations or klein talks about them in terms of brands and these are organizations which outsource many of their processes so in Klein's examples, it would be a company like, like Nike who don't manufacture their products, who don't design their products. They outsource all of those activities or they buy those activities from others. And what they really do is coordinate and market and create this brand, which people don't care about whether or not they, they make the products or not. Child, called it, child calls these hollow organizations because they're kind of organizations which don't have anything inside. So yeah, we've talked here about why structure is important. We've already talked about this point from Perot, but I'll just go through it again. Perot's point is that structure is important because structure often necessitates particular types of processes and attracts particular types of people. And if an organization succeeds or fails, it's easy to think it's because of the processes or the people, when actually it might be the structure. So, which structure should we use? How do you know what are the, the right types of structures, whether to have a tall or a flat, a centralized or decentralized structure, whether to have a unity of command or multiple reporting lines? There's four broad I called it technological earlier, didn't we? So I'll put that here. There's four broad approaches, which I'll try to go through pretty quickly. So first off, we've got the classic management approach. We've got the strategic management approach, which I'm actually thinking I'm going to talk about last. So we'll put that down here. <coughs> and we've got the... Oh, let's neaten that up a bit. Boom, boom, that's good. <laughs> Where was I? Yeah, we've got classic management, environment, technological school, and the strategic management school. I'll do this later. I should have probably not done it now. So in our book, Kaczynski and Buchanan, they relate these together in this little almost like organizational chart. Again, this might be kind of useful as a you know way for you to remember them, but I don't really think it's that useful myself. So Scientific management or classic management assumes there's one best way of organizing, no matter what you're doing, where you're doing it, or when you're doing it. Henry File um, summarizes this. He says that the best way to organize is you need to have a functional division of work. So you need to divide the work in terms of the functions. So all the marketers need to be together, all the accountants need to be together. You need hierarchical, spelt right, relationships. So you need vertical not matrixed ways of working together. You need bureaucratic forms of control, narrow supervisory spans, that's a low 
span of control, a narrow span of control. A supervisor only needs a few people and very closely prescribed roles and activities. So this is, this is a vision of an organization in which top managers <coughs> with functional specialisms tell people what to do. This is the classic management approach. And it was incredibly successful. You know, Henry Ford used it. By the 1970s, however, as mass production was giving way to more what's called flexible specialization, which is production of services and even production of physical goods that are not mass produced, but are customized to particular markets and customers. This very, very, very ordered and controlled style of organization started to fall away and we saw different approaches develop. The technological school says it's the best way to structure an organization depends on the type of technology that the organization uses to produce whatever it produces. And there's a variety of different ways of thinking about this. Woodward talks about the level of complexity in the technology. Thompson talks about the way the technology creates interdependencies. We talked about some of his interdependencies earlier. Perot talks about task variety and analyzability as defining four types of technology which each imply their own particular type of structure. So the key point on all these is if you know what kinds of technologies you depend upon you design around those technologies. Of course the assumption is you can't change the technology but that's open to question. So <coughs> this video is going on a little bit. I won't go through all these. You can look into them. This is Woodward's distinction between unit mass process production technologies. This is Thompson. We talked about his pooled sequential and reciprocal relationships and he said each of those relationships is determined by a type of technology. And this is Charles Perrault. His four types of technology. Craft, non-routine, engineering and routine technologies. Let's move on to the environmental determinism approach. This is a contingency approach which assumes that the best structure is contingent on features of the external environment which are outside of the control of the organization. So we've already had a lecture on the environment, so we won't go into this in detail, but there's a couple of things which we can mention here which haven't we didn't mention in the environment lecture because they're more related to organizational structure. So Williamson, Oliver Williamson, talks about the structure of markets and he distinguishes planned and unplanned markets and says depending on the structure of the market, organizations need a particular structure. Pfeffer and Solanik developed what they called resource dependency theory, which says organizations, spelt properly, I think they spelt it properly, depend on the environment for critical or strategic resources, which are in short supply. And successful organizations recognize those dependencies and are structured to access those resources as efficiently as possible. So finally then we've got strategic choice. And this assumes that structure is contingent on the strategy set by the senior leaders. It's based on Alfred Chandler's analysis of railways, the development of railways in the USA. And what this does is it highlights the ability of senior leaders to shape their environment, to change the technology that the organizations use. This is probably the predominant approach in organization theory now, which emphasizes not the ways that the organization structure should be determined by factors outside of the organization or outside of the control of senior leaders, but emphasizes the power that senior leaders have to set a strategy to change the environment in which they're working, to change the kinds of technology that they are using. So that was a bit of a whirlwind at the end, but We've talked about the elements of organizational structure. We've talked about the different approaches to designing structure. And throughout the class, we've contextualized some different elements of organizational design. If you're interested in reading further into organizational design, I'd strongly recommend Galbraith's Designing Organizations, which we have access to through the library. <coughs> My voice is running out, so I'm going to stop there. If you've got any questions, as ever, please go on Moodle onto the discussion forums or come to one of the drop-in Q&A sessions where I'll be available to answer any questions you may have.